On Anglia News in 20 minutes, the academic from Iraq, sacked from the University of East Anglia, loses his claim for racial discrimination. That's after the ITV Weekend News. Parents condemn leaders of school trip that ended in tragedy. Jailed, the man who tried to smuggle largest ever cocaine shipment. Cup dreams, the big weekend for the last eight. And hooray for Hollywood, the longest cinema queues in 25 years. The ITV Weekend News with Katie Derrick. Good evening. The parents of two teenage girls who were swept away and drowned on a school river walk in the Yorkshire Dales reacted angrily today when verdicts of accidental death were returned at the inquest. They called it a tragedy which could easily have been avoided given common sense on the part of the teachers. One family said in a statement, we will never forgive those responsible. Terry Lloyd reports. As the two bereaved families publicly criticised the organisers of the fateful school adventure holiday, the teachers involved stayed silent. Andy Miller had led 15 pupils on the river walk, even though some objected. Liz Schofield, in the light grey suit, joined the party in the water and stopped a third pupil from being swept away. They encouraged the youngsters to walk through Stainforth Beck in the Yorkshire Dales, even though the river was running three feet higher than normal. 14-year-old Rochelle Covey was the first to lose her balance. Although a teacher grabbed hold of her, the current was too strong. 13-year-old Hannah Black was also swept away. Her body was found miles downstream. At the time, locals who know the Beck described the walk as foolhardy. The parents agree. The hardest thing for us to deal with is the knowledge that this tragedy could so easily have been avoided if only thought and common sense had prevailed. It is too much to bear. We have lost our daughter, Rochelle. We will never forgive those responsible. Hannah's family said Royd School in Leeds had miserably failed to discharge its duty of care. Even before this tragedy, a handbook was available from the Department of Education and the local authority giving advice on school outdoor activities. But that was largely ignored because people regarded river walking here as a low-risk pursuit. Now, too late for the teenage girls, official new guidelines forbid such activities unless supervised by someone with appropriate qualifications. The coroner said the formal verdicts of accidental death were unrepresentative of what occurred. He'll be urging changes to school outdoor activities whilst the families consider legal action. Terry Lloyd, ITV News, Harrogate. The violence between Palestinians and Israelis, in which every attack is avenged, has now clocked up 45 dead since last night. That's the highest one-day toll in 17 months. Of the six Israelis killed, five were students. The 39 Palestinians included a general and a hospital director. Juliet Bremner has our report. The dead and wounded pile up as the Israelis and Palestinians escalate their fight, deaf to international appeals to halt the killing. The latest self-styled Palestinian martyr, 17-year-old Mohammed Farhat, whose goal in life was to kill as many Israelis as possible. He shot dead five Orthodox students at this settlement on the Gaza Strip before he himself was killed. His family said they were proud of his actions. He'd thrown grenades at the sleeping teenagers before shooting them as they tried to flee. The attack only reinforced Israeli determination to drive further into the towns and camps where Palestinians live, ripping up roads around Bethlehem as part of the ongoing fight against terror. There's certainly no sign of the ceasefire that the United States wants before it sends its peace envoy in next week. Far from pulling back as the Americans would like, the Israeli troops are pushing ever further forward into Palestinian-occupied land like here in Bethlehem, and as they do, the death toll rises relentlessly. The fighting is now so intense that no section of society is spared. Israeli tanks barge aside two ambulances that have been riddled with bullets. A doctor and nurse tending Palestinian casualties died in the assault. Crews from the Muslim-run Red Crescent drove in protest towards an Israeli roadblock. Their demand that no more medics should be killed. 
more frightened people in a country where no one now feels safe. Juliet Bremner, ITV News, Jerusalem. The Channel Tunnel will be closed to freight services for at least the next three days because of the number of asylum seekers trying to get through. Attempts by large numbers of people have continued in spite of increased security measures and last night alone 200 asylum seekers tried to enter the tunnel terminal. Five men were found guilty today of smuggling 90 million pounds worth of cocaine into Britain by yacht from the Caribbean. They were arrested as they came ashore on the Isle of Wight. Michael Tyrrell, who masterminded the operation, was jailed for 26 years. Other members of the gang got between 13 and 24 years. Harry Smith has the full story. This is the man who masterminded the 90 million pound smuggling operation, British born 54 year old Michael Turrell, who grew up in Antigua. It was he who bought the yacht Blue Hen, which carried the drugs to England. His vast wealth enabled him also to buy Orchard Bay House on the Isle of Wight, its private beach, a smuggler's paradise. They met their Colombian suppliers on an island close to Antigua. Then three of the gang took the drugs across the Atlantic on a 32-day voyage to the Isle of Wight. What the smugglers didn't realize was that their every move was being followed. In a surveillance operation coordinated here at Customs Headquarters in London, they were filmed as they went about planning their trip and buying equipment. And customs officers were there to meet them when they landed their cargo on the Isle of Wight. But even before customs swooped, the smugglers were in deep trouble. Engine failure forced them to land at Woody Bay, a mile off target. The blue line on this picture shows the dangerous cliff path along which the gang had to manhandle the huge bales of cocaine while the surveillance team waited for the moment to pounce. Obviously they were very capable of bringing vast quantities of drugs into the country um, and had they been successful, uh, the streets would have been flooded with an enormous amount of cocaine. The five men were sentenced to a total of 99 years in prison. They'll now face court action to confiscate the wealth they acquired from drugs. Harry Smith, ITV News. The High Court judge in the case of the paralysed woman who wants her support life machine switched off said today she bridled at the notion that doctor knows best. Dame Elizabeth Butler Sloss made her comment during the final day of exchanges over whether Miss B's anger at her continuing treatment was affecting her judgment. Miss B has been listening to the hearing via a video link from her hospital bed. The people of an impoverished Zimbabwe go to the polls in their presidential election tomorrow and on Sunday, if they haven't been disenfranchised, that is, or aren't too scared to vote. Today, President Mugabe was again rally, railing as much against Tony Blair as his challenger, Morgan Changarai. Here's Tim Hewitt, one of the few TV correspondents covering the election from inside Zimbabwe. The polls here open five hours from now. It will be Zimbabwe's fiercest and most controversial election. Opposition supporters gathered outside a factory in Harare today. The police have banned scores of their rallies under stringent election laws. Their candidate, Morgan Changarai, receives only ridicule in the state media. Today's story, his alleged plans to flee the country when he loses. There are all these speculations about Changira running away. Don't believe that. President Mugabe arrived in appropriate style for his 51st and final rally. The theme was familiar, linking Zimbabwe's opposition to white British interests, ridiculing Tony Blair, but praising past conservative leaders like Margaret Thatcher. Mrs. Thatcher would say, come on, let's not quarrel, let's sit down. But not so this arrogant little fellow. He will not want to discuss. Very arrogant and yes, blunderous in the extreme. He has messed himself up in regard to Zimbabwe. But Mr. Mugabe's greatest enemy may be the economy. When we filmed this food queue, people cheered for the opposition. Annual inflation is now 116%, unemployment 60%. Defense! Defense! Even intimidation by Mr. Mugabe's activists may not be enough to deter voters from expressing their discontent in overwhelming numbers. As ballot boxes were sent out this evening, the opposition said their greatest challenge would be to win despite vote rigging. The result should emerge on Monday night. A significant delay might suggest an upset for Mr. Mugabe 
and tense and perhaps dangerous days ahead. Tim Hewitt, ITV News, Harare. The Pentagon claimed tonight to be winning the battle against al-Qaeda and Taliban forces in the mountains near Gardez in eastern Afghanistan. Though President Bush warned of more such battles to come. Our Washington correspondent Robert Moore reports. Fresh American reinforcements are arriving in an attempt to finish the battle by the end of the weekend. The level of resistance has surprised U.S. forces, but the Pentagon now believes large numbers of al-Qaeda fighters have been killed. We have killed lots, lots of al-Qaeda and Taliban. Uh, I won't give you precise numbers, uh, but we've got confirmed kills in the hundreds. Wounded and evacuated soldiers have been speaking about the battle. When we come under fire, uh, small arms, some machine gun fire, and uh, some mortar fire as well. And uh, we just uh, proceed to take cover and uh, fight the enemy back. Amid patriotic chants, President Bush spoke emotionally of the American battlefield dead. And I'm sad for loss of life. And today we've got the mom and dad of a brave soldier who lost his life. And a brother. God bless you. In Washington, new photos have been released showing the terrorist attacks that triggered the war. Until now, no images had been seen of the moment the hijacked plane struck the Pentagon. The building itself is largely repaired. Today, film crews were allowed to see the construction crews at work. Six months after the terrorist attacks and the renovation work is ahead of schedule. The intention is that by the first anniversary, this wing of the building will be back in use. But it's being rebuilt with added precautions against another terrorist attack. Robert Moore, ITV News, Washington. Football and its quarter-finals weekend in the FA Cup. Tomorrow, Newcastle play Arsenal, who got to the final last year. On Sunday, Middlesbrough play Everton. Spurs, beaten finalists in the Worthington Cup, take on Chelsea. And West Brom of the First Division play Fulham. Felicity Barr weighs up the prospects. Critics claim the Cup has lost its luster, but Newcastle's Bobby Robson would disagree. It's 24 years since he last lifted the trophy as manager of Ipswich. Ironically, that triumph was against Arsenal, the very team Newcastle faced tomorrow. I mean, Arsenal-Newcastle is, is, is a humdinger. Uh, it was a draw that Arsenal didn't want, and I don't think we wanted it. It's put the two big clubs together. We can't change it, so we just have to, you know, get out and see what we can do. But of course, it is the time of the round. It is a massive game for both clubs. Arsenal have the psychological advantage after beating Newcastle last weekend. The Gunners are still hopeful of winning the treble. Well, we go for it, of course, and really we can do it. That's why it is on. But uh, it, 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 we are, we are uh, prepared, concentrated, and we believe we have a potential. Tottenham face Chelsea, hoping to repeat the performance which saw them thrash their London rivals in the Worthington Cup. West Brom are the only non-premiership side left in the competition. They hope to continue their giant killing run by beating Fulham at the Hawthorns. And whilst they've got um, uh, multi-million pound stars in their side and they've got people that have played in World Cups and, uh, and internationals, uh, they might not have been into a, into a, a cauldron that is a, a West Midlands six round uh, ground. Paul Gascoigne could start for Everton in their quarter-final against Middlesbrough. The Cup should be a welcome break for both sides who are fighting to avoid relegation. Felicity Barr, ITV News. Now, more of us are going to the pictures nowadays than at any time since the early 1970s. That's according to new statistics today. It's partly because of the success of films like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. Here's Neil Connery. More and more of us can't resist a trip to the flicks. Cinema audiences in the UK are now at their highest for nearly 30 years. Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me where I might find platform nine and three quarters? Nine and three quarters? I think you're being funny, do you? Big screen successes like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings have drawn huge audiences, leading to the busiest year at the box office since the early 1970s. Those who once thought cinema would disappear have been left choking on their popcorn. 
In cinema's heyday of the 1950s, there were an astounding 1.4 billion visits a year, with competition from television audiences had been much smaller, falling to just under 200 million in 1970. They fell again with the arrival of video, down to 53 million in 1984. But by last year, more than 140 million tickets were sold. So what's behind the rise? Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. I think the summer had been solid but not spectacular. But to get two films, both of them, in the top three, four movies of all time, following subsequent months, that was an amazing thing. Film fans say the big screen experience can't be beaten. You can't replicate the whole massive big screen thing in the sound and all that surround sound as well as you could, like here. I think if you've got a good film and the tensions there and all that, like you're hanging on the edge of your seat and all that sort of stuff, that's what I like about it. Cinemas may never be as popular as they were in the 1950s, but even in this age of the DVD, it seems most of us still think it's hard to beat a night out at the pictures. Neil Connery, ITV News. Tonight's main headline, the families of two teenage girls swept away and drowned on a school river walk in the Yorkshire Dales have rejected inquest verdicts of accidental death. They suggest the school was to blame. And that's it from the ITV Weekend News. I'll be back tomorrow, but until then, from all the team here, good night. On three, one, two. <laughs> yeah. Power Gen. Energy for you and your little monsters, come rain or shine. Good evening now. Turning out to be a fairly fine night once the last of that rain has cleared from the southeast. A pleasant sunrise, very likely, but make the most of it as it isn't going to last. We could get anything tomorrow from rain, sleet, and snow pushing in from the west. So back to tonight. We've still got that rain edging further south, reaching the far southeast by dawn. Some clear spells behind that. Some scattered showers across more western parts, and we've still got those wintry showers in western Scotland. Now, a chilly night on the cards as well. Temperatures dipping down to around 1 Celsius up there across parts of Scotland. So, some ground frost likely and maybe even a touch of ice underneath those clearer skies. Windy as well up there in the north. So, tomorrow after a pleasant sunrise, a fair amount of sunshine. The only real exception being across western Scotland. We've still got those wintry showers. And later on, cloud moving in towards Northern Ireland, pushing its way in from the west. Now, what's going to happen is that that's going to start pushing its way down and through southern Scotland in towards northern England, bringing a significant amount of snow, in particular over the hills. Further south you are, we've got squally showers constantly pushing their way eastwards across much of England and Wales, and winds picking up tomorrow, gale force across the Irish sea coast in particular. So here's the temperatures for tomorrow. Further south you are, still fairly mild, pretty much up into double figures. Their highs of around 12 Celsius. But of course, further north you go, in amongst that sleet, rain and snow struggling, only highs of around 6 or 7 Celsius. So here's the weather picture for tomorrow. Enjoy yourself tonight and I'll catch you very soon. Bye-bye for now. Power Gen. Energy for you and your little monsters come rain or shine.